retreat the, during the winter's winter time is, of course, it's supported by lay community offering the dana, both in practical terms and coming here to help cook or work, administer, sending donations. to uh, support us during this time, people bringing food or like the Leeds group coming today to prepare a meal for us tomorrow. So it's always a very good thing to re- recollect this, that the, we are practicing the Dhamma and that, that this uh, alms this generosity given to the Sangha, that we are worthy of this. Now the act of dana is always an act of generosity, giving. This uh, dana baramita can be taken to to its uh, totality of total giving of oneself. Uh, in uh, monastic life, the aim, the ultimate aim and purpose is to give away, give up all selfish interests, to be just a a uh, servant of the Buddha and Dhamma Sangha. So these are the images and expressions we have for that joyousness that comes from not demanding, not expecting, not wanting anything for oneself as a person, personality. In the Western world, we tend to suffer a lot from guilt. Guilt is a common problem with all of us. Uh, A feeling of our own worthlessness or inadequacy. That uh, guilt seems to to, uh, follow us about. We can be so so guilt-ridden over the fact that we haven't really... Uh, maybe we haven't lived up to the highest standards that we can imagine, and so that we we um, not only do we feel a sense of shame or have a conscience at wrongdoing, but we can even feel guilty about uh, all possibilities of wrongdoing, or the fact that we're we're actually breathing or living, or our presence exists, or that. We may not be perfect. So this this guilt is a, is a, something that tends to follow us and destroy joyousness and happiness in our lives. Now, many of you 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 tend to dwell on your faults and and mistakes and failures and this uh, obsessiveness obsessive concern uh, with the with what's wrong you either with yourself or with others or with whatever you're dealing with your emphasis is always on is, is through criticizing it through exaggerating the flaw, the mistake. And one of the practices most uh, praised by the Buddha is to recollect uh, the goodness of one's life. And this, of course, is not so easy for us to do because our minds are conditioned to dwell on what's wrong. As much as what's wrong with oneself or wrong with others. What's wrong with with the food? What's wrong with the place? What's wrong with the weather? What's wrong with this or that? We fill our minds with what's wrong, with gossip, scandals, scandalous stories, the failures of others, the failures of ourselves. And we don't really know how to, say, gladden the heart or bring into consciousness uh, the goodness, our virtues, our successes, 
our beauty. Now, if I should say, try to try to bring into consciousness the the idea that you are beautiful, what would you do with that? What is your mind? How does your mind react to that? The idea that you are a a beautiful being, loving, beautiful, good, virtuous, and the negative forces within us tend to scoff or laugh or make a kind of cynical comment, doesn't it? None of us, uh, we would never talk this way in public, saying, I am a beautiful person, would sound like a gross kind of boasting, very uh, inappropriate way to talk about oneself, even to think about oneself, even if you are beautiful. But then beauty is oftentimes equated with physical appearance, whether you have beautiful eyes, nose, lips, hair, nails, teeth, and skin, hair of the body, hairy body. <laughs> But beauty is is a part of our life's experience, isn't it? Things are beautiful. Beauty is is a force in nature, a very powerful force in nature. So, it's if just imagine a world, uh, a life without any beauty at all. Everything were just either mediocre, neither beautiful, nor ugly, or just ugly. We have so much beauty around us, just in nature. <clears throat> we also, in as a part of nature, as as part of this uh, natural realm, uh, we have our own beauty, which has nothing to do with uh, with whether you have uh, beautiful eyes. Is that the human beauty uh, is is of the spirit, the soul, that that ability we have to to be selfless, to be generous. To to be able to love, to be able to give, to radiate, to have this radiating radiations, this radiance from our hearts. These are, these are also part of a human being's uh, potential. But as long as you think in terms of your faults and flaws and what's wrong with everything, then of course we lose that radiant quality, that beauty. It doesn't, it is, it is dampened down or shut off, turned off. For example, as soon as you start thinking in negative ways, you lose your radiance immediately just by hating somebody or feeling depressed or guilt-ridden or resentful or bitter, uh, thinking about yourself, wanting something for yourself, all these kind of, of selfish emotions. That we give so much attention to, and and uh, are so overwhelmed by, and of course, then the radiant quality of our humanity is is hidden underneath that cloud, dismal cloud of self-concern, negativity. Here in the West, Western world, where we spend so much time, fee. Uh, Thinking about ourselves and analyzing ourselves and and uh, feeling guilty uh, about ourselves and being critical about ourselves and being critical about the people around us, where being critical has become the dominant function of our mind. Sometimes it's it's. It's, uh, it's that we have to take to drink, don't we, sometimes, to, to break the, the pattern. At least when, when you have a few beers down, you, you, can, you aren't so critical. Critical factors aren't so sharp. 
or these uh, drugs also give a, a kind of temporary relief sometimes from the, this negativity to smoke some pot or take some hallucinogenic drugs and you, you might be set up for an interesting show of something or other or pleasurable feelings for a while but these are inadequate ways of, of dealing with the problem So we, re we reflect on what brings us here to Amravati anyway. Just the fact that we would want to come to such a place or be an in, have some kind of interest in a place like Amravati means that there is so your, your awakening, there's a measure of awakening to, or a spiritual awakening or aspiration within you. That's something to to remember. This is what brings you here. Of course, your critical faculties will say, well, it's because I, probably just for some selfish reason I come here because I want the monks to solve my problems and I want them. You could, you could give it the worst possible connotation if you want, but I wouldn't bother with that. I wouldn't assume that, that you are the uh, conglomeration of all possible selfish motives and inadequate intentions. I would make the assumption that the fact that, that when I hear the Dhamma, that I like hearing it, it makes me happy to hear Dhamma, uh, that, the, that my life, the attraction, when I first heard the Buddha's teachings, I felt some a, a real sense of hope and confidence. That's uh, something good in me, isn't it? I consider it so. The fact that, that say, when I was 21 years old, I read a, a passage out of a book on Zen Buddhism, and I had this wonderful feeling of, of confidence and faith. Well, that, must, that conveys that there's something very good, basically good in me. At least that's how I see it. I'm not doesn't sound like boasting, but I'm just trying, reflecting for how to, for you to how to contemplate and bring into your mind the goodness of your own life, your own beauty, wisdom, truth, ability to love, ability to sacrifice selfish interests for the welfare of others coming to, or driving down from Leeds to Amravati. People coming to give, to offer, not to... Even if you think you... you, you people from Leeds, you might uh, think the true reason you came is to get something from the monks. You might think that's your real motive, but I wouldn't believe that. I would, I would make... I would, I would take that attitude that, that I came here to offer to the Sangha. This is a beautiful quality, something to that you can respect yourself for for having that even that impulse and that intention and the, and put it into action to to take the time to drive down the M one, which is not always a pleasant thing to have to do on those motorways and come down here in order to listen to the Dhamma in order to offer food to the Sangha. So when you think of this moment and tomorrow, when you, no matter what uh, irritations, frustrations happen in regards to this or that, keep remembering, bring back into your mind this joyous quality, this, this, uh, this beautiful virtuousness of generosity, that this is, this is something to, to trust in yourself, the fact that you find offering and giving to the Sangha something positive and, and joyous. One can see in, in humanity we, we can be joyous creatures the ability to, to love and to be joyful, to be happy. 
thinking, reflecting on sila, that we determine to not do things. We have, not only do we have the ability to do something good, we also have the ability to determine not to do things that are that are bad. So the thing with the five sila, the eight sila, ten sila, the padimoka training for the for the monk, the ways of I would say restraining, refraining, renouncing. Those actions those ways of doing things that cause disruption or confusion, misery to oneself and to others. Now that's a beautiful ability, isn't it? To the fact that we we want to keep sila. We we can actually determine to refrain from killing, uh, from stealing and so forth. And that's a marvelous ability we have something to to uh, respect in yourself that you incline to do that that you want to actually stay within the limits of the panchasila, the five precepts or the eight precepts ten precepts because to to refrain from doing things sometimes is more difficult than they doing things, doing good things. It's more difficult sometimes to refrain from saying something in anger than it is to say something when you're uh, something good and loving when you're in a happy mood. So sila is is a is, is another important uh, virtue that we develop as Buddhists. Refraining from doing that which is unsuitable, inappropriate, causes division, disruption, confusion to ourselves and others. So these two virtues, dana, sila, they are the foundation, the very basis for the holy life, for spiritual development being able to give, to share what you have with others, to give yourself, to be generous. And the radiant joy that comes from generosity. The sila, the, the, the determination, the intention to refrain from doing harmful things. So there's this, this active side and this passive side, refraining from and, and, uh, and good actions. This is, remember that we are in this state, uh, this conscious state, where we, we live in this realm of, of action. It's a dynamic realm, it's not static. You can't find a, a static refuge. You can't find a place where everything stops in the conditioned realm. The bodies, the, all the forces, the powerful forces that are affecting us, such as the human body and the conditions of the mind, are all impermanent, changing, dynamic forms. So that there's no way uh, that we can kind of make it otherwise. Even the idea of suicide or trying to, to just uh, become insensitive, bury one's head in the sand, not to notice this, this doesn't work either. So in this realm of activity, action, energy, uh, we, we learn how to, to do good and refrain from doing evil. And this takes wisdom and mindfulness to be able to, to operate in this way. And this is our human heritage. This is the the wonder of our humanity is that we can actually do this. We can actually use wisdom in our lives. We can actually do good and refrain from doing evil.
This is within our potential and possibility. This is our perfection. This is our beauty. We are then beautiful creatures, radiant creatures, rather than miserable wretches. Now, being a miserable wretch is what we tend to be used to. Self-pity, um, carrying grudges, resenting, jealousies, envies, just being critical and negative, hating and, and getting angry and feeling guilty and uh, being obsessed with, with me, with my, what I think, with my mood, and my uh, failures, and myself. This tends to be a very common problem in, in the Western world, anyway. Then, uh, say, there are those that, that are, are the opposite, who don't think very much about uh, what they've done wrong, but are constant, like hedonistic types that just uh, live on the surface of fun and pleasure just trying to skate along and have a good time it's going from one pleasurable experience one interesting, exciting pleasurable pleasant, comfortable experience to another but that also uh, does not, that still uh, uh, operating from the sense of a self uh, there's no wisdom in that kind of behavior there's no even the, even though it, it might be uh, give you a little bit of happiness the being positive and, and trying to enjoy life at least is a, is a happier state to live within than just being depressed and negative and critical but it still is unsatisfying because it one has to con usually we have to exert so much control over our condition uh, over the things around us to try to keep them prop them up hold on hang on to the things we love and give us happiness and pleasure that that eventually we become we turn sour we become negative and embittered by our, our, our inability to make life the way we want it and keep it and hold on to it. In this retreat, we've, uh, we're really learning how to contemplate the flow of life, which we see it in its pleasurable, painful, pleasant, unpleasant aspects, But the witness and the knower of pleasure and pain rather than the being that becomes happy or becomes miserable according to what one is experiencing. So this is called transcendent wisdom, know, uh, being able to transcend the conditioned realm not by uh, refusing to, to participate in it but by understanding it, by seeing it, knowing it for what it is. I think it's very important for the majority of you to bring into consciousness your own goodness because uh, the, for many of you that's very difficult it's, it's, it seems it's embarrassing or even uh, one arouses negative a kind of cynical uh, emotional responses the idea of me being good and beautiful is something uh, that that uh, resists this kind of thinking. But I notice that 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 the fact that I think the other thought, I am good and loving and beautiful being, even though the conditioned side of me tends to be a bit make a want to make a cynical joke about it. I'm not going to follow that anymore. I'm not going to go along with that kind of mental 
habits. Because the good, the true and the beautiful is something that we shouldn't make fun of. In a profane society such as this one, we, we've lost that sense of the sacred for what is, what is pure and good. Uh, we, we tend to, to be cynics, critics, And so we live in this kind of profanity, making what is sacred into a something profane, modern materialism, modern life is a is a life of profanity. It's a profaned existence. It's lost its sanctity. So we can we can make jokes about the sacred and and uh, and and be cynical and and be clever in our negative ways, but we pay the price for it with depression, with self hatred, with uh, the black clouds that hang around our heart and our spirit is lost and smothered in this in this uh, these heavy clouds of black smoke negativity and bitterness. I like to take the English words like the good, the true, and the beautiful and contemplate them as, uh, in, uh, as, as an experience of my life. What in my life is, has been good, true, and beautiful? So that I, I recollect it. I bring into consciousness my ability to be conscious, memories, the memories of my life that are good, true, and beautiful, that offer these, this, this sense of being good, of being the truth, of being beautiful. Trying to bring into my consciousness the realization of the good, the true, and the beautiful, the loving, the joyous, what is it that, that makes me happy? What brings me joy? What, what, is, what is joy? What is love? When we love, what is that? What is that? Uh, as a, when we remember, say, even falling in love, what was, what was the essence of that experience? The cynic says sexual desire or something like that, doesn't it? The the negative critic, the cynic will say, oh, it's just sexual desire. So love becomes equated with sex in, in the profane mind of modern humanity. And sex is, is profaned by being just a kind of gross physical function uh, that we use just for selfish indulgence and pleasure seeking and distraction, tension relieving, all these kinds of things. Now people that uh, are quite willing to to advise uh, all kinds of sexual behavior to relieve tensions or to, uh, you know, always some kind of self-interest so that, that sex is no longer e even seen in any other way than in the most profane terms, coarse terms. I remember when I first became a monk and the people would talk about the Devadas and the Brahmas in Thailand and I used to, my mind was so profane by then that, I, that these symbols, these kind of radiant creatures, Devadas and angels and that, were, it was just absolute Hocus pocus, poppycock to me. I thought these people are superstitious. Devadas and Brahmas and all that. There aren't anything. There aren't such things because the, the my mind had never entertained that possibility, had never contemplated those symbols, and had and had never awakened to that experience. 
the mind by the time when I first ordained became a Buddhist monk was was a mind programmed through profanity, through the mundane, through the earthbound, even though there was certainly a spiritual aspiration and longing for the good and the true and the beautiful, but the actual conditioned mind, the mind that one grasped and identified with, was a very uh, profane mind bound in very coarse, crude perceptions. Now, reflecting on one's own beauty and goodness, of course, means that that we're not we're not trying to convince ourselves. It's not a kind of affirmation that I'm expecting you to do. It's going, I'm beautiful, I'm good, I say. Uh, it's not affirmation, but it's it's contemplation of that. What is, what is the what is the goodness of my life? The beauty. During this winter, uh, when we're walking, uh, say practicing walking meditation, I used to contemplate just the during those uh, just before the cold spell. I used to go out to the Buddha grove and walk in the afternoon just to 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 be with the beauty to the mind allow the mind to be open and receptive to just the beauty of that just the visual beauty of the Buddha grow and the light the 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 uh, afternoon light The fact that one can look at beauty, can see and perceive and contemplate beauty, this is, this is a truly miraculous and wonderful thing that we, can, we all are capable of doing. But beauty needs to be open to it and to be uh, we, we need to allow ourselves to be receptive to it rather than just because we, we tend to be critical rather than, than say receptive to the beautiful like walking out in the Buddha grove on a January afternoon grey uh, day wind blowing uh, cold wind blowing across the field Gray skies. One could just be critical, couldn't I? You think <gasps> cold weather, wind, and uh, gray skies, and I don't like this. One could be just caught in criticizing it, not liking it, because it's not comfortable, is it, to be walking out uh, in the cold, in a, in a cold wind, for an hour, several hours. It's not comfortable. It's not sensually, in a sense, a sens sensually comfortable. It's not the kind of beauty that, that uh, say, attracts us. It's not, it's not pretty. An afternoon like that is not pretty. It doesn't, it isn't, doesn't uh, zap us with its, with its prettiness. Its beauty lies in, in through in, is realized through contemplation, through opening our heart to it by being receptive to it, by being fully with it, with the feeling, with the moment as is, with the wind, with the, with the temperature, with the with the light of the afternoon, with the mood, with the way it is. Then we experience these sobhanajita or this, these beautiful states of mind but if you're caught up with yourself you, you, one can go out and do that and be thinking about oneself your mind's not receptive to anything it's just thinking oh no, no I don't like this and I don't think I can do that and he said that to me and she didn't do that and, uh, uh, uh. we could spend the day just uh, 
going around and around with with our complaints, feelings of of um, inadequacy, or dwelling on our faults, feeling sorry for ourselves, wanting to leave, feeling offended, and and uh, of course those all those states do not allow any receptivity to anything. It shuts you down. You become enclosed within yourself, incarcerated in your bodies. You become like dead things, broken records. So even in the midst of, of beauty, goodness, truth and beauty, you, you, you miss out. Even when it's surrounding you, you can be totally unaware of it, totally caught in a false view, concern for yourself, the conditions of your mind, the criticisms, the negativity, the resentments and that. And of course that is the, the hell realm. One lives in the realm of misery, unmitigated misery. The more selfish you become, the more unmitigated the misery is. And to have mitigated misery means that you at least have moments of not being interested in yourself, where you can maybe give something and have a joyous moment. I can't think of anything more depressing and more unwanted than just thinking about myself as a person. And I've lived quite a good life in the past 25 years being a monk. I mean, I haven't done very hardly anything that you could say was heavy karma. Being a Buddhist monk for 25 years, you don't, haven't done anything very bad. But yet, just thinking about myself as a person, I find uh, just a, a, a waste of time. Me as a personality, me as this, me as that. And it takes me to despair. It's depressing and boring and dreary. Not that I'm depressing and boring and dreary, it's just that whole process, that whole illusion is, is, is a realm of misery. Selfishness, self-concern, uh, self-hatred, self-criticism, self-contempt is a realm that is miserable. Its very nature is misery. Because it's an illusion, it's based on, on uh, obsessive concern and belief and attachment, ignorance. And yet, in any moment, there is this possibility for awakening. We can, in any moment, every moment is a moment, a possible moment of enlightenment, of being free from all self, of being receptive, open, liberated, and free to the moment as is, in whatever way, whatever qualities, conditions that one is experiencing. Which isn't with a it isn't a demand that they be pleasant or pretty, but we have the, when we to see the path, the way out of suffering, we realize it is always here and now. Every moment is completely new, renewal. We are not victims of the past. And because we're no, no longer victims of the past, we no longer dread or fear or, or worry about the future. The future brings is not particularly uh, important or interesting to us anymore because the past is no longer regarded in the same way. I think in the, in the January I did the reflections every morning on this is the beginning of the day. The past is a memory. The, the future is the unknown. 
keep reflecting on that every day, all the time. So this this perception of time is is being uh, challenged because time, the perception of time, is very real to most people. Time is reality. <clears throat> the past is real. The the future is real. And so that that the we we regard time and uh, a year, 1991, is being the real world. A day, a night, a week, a month. My age is reality, isn't it? I am 57 years old, is real. I am that. My history, my, my, the history of my life. One can people say have asked me if I'm going to write an autobiography, or if some people want to write a biography of me. Why bother? You sit down and try to write about yourself and, and the past. It no longer seems real. Just bunch of memories but we you know we, we like to entertain ourselves with, with the biographies of various beings inspires sometimes can be inspiring or revealing or whatever but we must recognize that really the, any biography biographical sketches are, are not very real at all They're just words and perceptions and opinions and views, usually, or memories, personal memories. So much of what has happened in the past is is inexpressible in words, anyway. And yet we can regard our past as being real, as being more real than this moment. And therefore, the future is always uh, something to worry about because uh, of our experiences in the past, the future being uncertain, un- unsure, unclear, then the, the mind will start dreading or anticipating or fearing or worrying about the possibilities in the future. But the here and now is where we establish our, where we are, where is the only real thing at this moment is here and now. One thing I know is I'm here. There's now. And through this reflection in the the kind of ingrained habitual attachments to uh, conventional time uh, falls away. I find like that just the, just uh, the one is is more receptive to the flow in consciousness. Conscious experience is a flux and a flowing experience rather than the old way of perceiving in these kind of clunky perceptions of me having been born and having done this in the past and then the future with all its hopes and fears and dreads as being the real world we can give a, a month, two month meditation retreat a sense of being a long time how many of you think two months Winter's retreat is a long time. But where is it now? Less than a week left of it's the 24th. February is only 28 days, so we get we, we too bad we have February rather than March. If 30 31 days in March You'd have 31 days in January. You could skip over February 
get rid of the 28-day kind of irregularity. February is always a bit of a hassle, isn't it? Because it's 28 days or 29 days leap year. This is the real world, though, isn't it? February being leap year or not, this is reality. My birthday and all these, this is the real world. And my feelings is re are real and important. And what I think and what I want in my life. But on reflection, contemplation, uh, that sense of me, when you take the me out of anything, I used to practice the sitting posture and say, take, take me out of the sitting posture, just the, the sitting. When there's just sitting, then there's no me, then there's no suffering. As soon as I come back into the sitting, then there's, then there's restlessness, then there's uh, watching the clock, and there's uh, all kinds of unpleasant things happening, creating this frustrations and whatnot, uh, but because I've come back into, into being someone who's sitting. Take me out of the walking, or me out of the standing, or me out of the lying down, me out of the eating of the food. Let the me disappear, let it vanish. And what's left is the way it is. And the way it is, is Dhamma. And there's, when there is the realization of Dhamma, or the way it is, then there's no suffering. Suffering always comes back with the birth of me into whatever you're doing, or what's ever happening. With Dhamma, giving, and when there's no me in the giving, then there's joy. I regard that as joyful. When when there's no when the me is taken out of the giving, then there is joy. As soon as me gets into it, as soon as I'm someone who's giving and doing something good, then the joy is lost, and there's just the experience of giving something and expecting something, a reward or acknowledgement or something, wanting something back. So the me in the in the giving destroys joy. Being reborn as me, as a as a conditioned being, as a as a as this or that, as a man or a woman, a monk or a nun, or a, an American or Englishman or whatever, any of those unchallenged conditions, attachments, views, opinions, take one to the experience of despair. That's what despair is. Hopeless. Failure. Misery. Anguish and grief. Self-pity. I'm just no good. I can't do it. I'm a failure. I, I'm just... Uh, I did this and then I did that and... And I'm not as good as that person and nobody loves me and all this kind of thinking is a, a kind of birth being reborn in this negative state this realm of pain and misery suffering but the way out of suffering then is not through suicide or annihilation of the self or of me but of understanding so that the me is 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 allowed to disappear because it's a it's a shadow it's a specter it's a phantom me is, a, is an illusion it's something added and compounded so it, it's it, it's not the real world me is not the me is not real not reality so when the me is gone then there is the flow of, of life consciousness it's this way continuously changing and therefore nothing stuck 
one can be with that flow due to our ability to reflect and contemplate it. We can transcend the conditioned realm not by rejecting it, but by non-grasping, not grasping it, by understanding it and not grasping, and through understanding then there is no grasping it. When there is no grasping, then there's no becoming. And when there's no becoming, there's no rebirth as me. And then when there's no rebirth as me, then there's no soka pariteva tukatomanasupayasa, or grief, sorrow, despair, anguish, lamentation. The whole thing collapses. The miserable realm disappears. Then there, there is Dhamma, though. There is goodness and beauty and truth. Life is like this. The sense realm is this way. Pain is, is, is what it is, but it's no longer mine. Sickness is, feels this way, but it's no longer me that's sick. <laughs> Being cold, rainy, gray skies and cold, damp weather is the way it is, but there's no me making, wanting it to be otherwise. It's completely receptive to the flow of life in, in the way, in, in whatever way it flows. One can be perfectly at peace with diseases or perfectly miserable with them. If I put myself into a disease and I'm sick, I don't want to be sick, take away this sickness, get me to a doctor quick, doctor, please give me some pills, take away these uncomfortable symptoms and this physical pain, say I'm going to be all right, Tell me everything is okay. That's a wretched uh, being, isn't it? Somebody who's who's become something. And of course the result of that becoming is misery and pain. Or these bodies are subject to aging and sickness and pain. It's just the way it is. It's not mine. It's just the way it is. So, it's getting old. That's the way it is. There's, there's no me in, in the in the aging. There's no me in the in the sickness or the disease. It's just, and therefore, one the 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 sickness and disease is 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 not something to cause suffering. It's unpleasantness, discomfort is is not is no is not resented. We're not frightened by it. We're not wanting it to be otherwise. We can bear with the flow of life as is in whatever forms, qualities, conditions that we experience because we know it is this way and we don't demand, expect it to be any other way. (laughs) Then we have the choice to determine to do good and refrain from doing bad as as in as as a separate individual creatures i think that's a beautiful thing and i can i i i think it's miraculous and wonderful that this creature here this this being here can decide can determine i'm not just a a kind of uh puppet on a string or just some kind of a pavlovian poodle just victimized by life and and just a creature of habit without any ability to to decide about anything but i uh, but the human mind i imagine you're all the same you can you can actually determine to do good things like the leaves group coming determining to come here to offer food one can in the monastic life determine to live this life for the welfare of all sentient beings we can we can actually think perceive that possibility that may the goodness of this life that I'm living be of benefit to all sentient beings that is a a wonderful ability we have it's miraculous 
To me it's a miracle. That's what miracles are. That this 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 heavy formation with all its instinctual drives, you know, we're equipped with 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 instinct and with and with all the things that that implies. We can we, we can move to any level, any realm we choose. We can be demonic. We can be anim- uh, bestial. We can be angelic. In the human realm, you've got tremendous uh, range uh, of possibilities for becoming. But as Buddhists, Buddhist sometimes we choose what? Not the becoming person, but the we choose the Dhamma, the, the way out of birth and death. Not annihilation, but no longer do we choose to become anything. We're not choosing uh, a realm or a place or a rebirth because we're realizing the true nature of things, the deathless reality, the Amata Dhamma. And this is this scene is quite marvelous, isn't it? That we can realize the Amata Dhamma, deathless reality. That the true nature of things is deathless rather than death bound. That the death bound conditions are the way they are, but they're not ours. We no longer identify, inclined to identify with the conditioned realm. We no longer expect the conditioned realm to be anything but what it is. So therefore we can be receptive to its flow, to the way it is, because we're not, we're not frightened by it, we're not criticizing it. So we discover it, we find our happiness and joy and appreciation in, in conditions that before we would never have noticed or been totally unreceptive to. So as someone does here, Amaravati, we have we're really very fortunate in in uh, the, to me the the uh, the fact that that the two month retreat has been supported so well, so eagerly by the lay people. Eager, I mean, they've been really and they've tried to they've done so well. They've put forth so much effort, and one has felt it's coming from their heart from something very good. This is another kind of miracle too, that, that that people can find such happiness and can actually do this, can actually uh, incline to the good, the true and the beautiful. Eager to hear, eager to know, eager to see that which is good, that which is true, that which is beautiful. Eager to be that way, and to be that way, you really need to to allow that to be the way you are, rather than to believe the tendencies to be self-critical, guilt-ridden, these negative states which we easily fall into, dwelling on our weaknesses, our faults, what's wrong, and believing that in that as the real world, then of course we are born, we've become, we've put ourselves into this state of becoming and the result of that is grief, despair, anguish. So contemplate this and, and uh, you know, really when, when I say snap out of it, even though that might sound like a trite expression or being facetious, but it really, rather than than hanging around, indulging in self-hatred and and criticism and and negative states, stop it. Stop just being doing that, and and have the courage to be with the flow of life. Trust in it to just. Allow yourself to relax and be open, receptive to life as you're experiencing it. 
as you're experiencing it as an individual being. There's not any way you should experience it. There's not some way that everyone should experience it because we have to experience it from where we are, from the way we are. So we're not looking at it in, as if there's kind of one reality that everyone should be experiencing, but we are willing to be receptive and open to the flow of life as we're experiencing it in the feeling uh, of pleasure and pain, even to allowing the despair and the guilt to be fully experienced so that it is not wallowed in, not believed in, not grasped, and it's not despised and rejected, but it is fully experienced. It is the way it is. And like everything else, it it's impermanent and it's not self. So even our despair, our self-hatred, guilt, and remorse are a part of our flow of life, our life's experience. If they arise, they cease. And so it's in, and when you no longer identify or become someone who's despairing or guilt-ridden, then there's no suffering. It's just this way. Guilt is the feeling, what we would consider guilt or despair, then is seen as Dhamma. It feels like this, it's this way. It's not permanent. There's no suffering. It goes very, it quite uh, easily disappears if you don't you don't hang on to it. So one even begins to say, feel grateful even for one's faults. I think without having a lot of faults and being such a difficult character myself that would never have dedicated my life so wholeheartedly to this 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 uh, the Buddhist monasticism. If I could have had the best of everything in the world, like I wanted when I was younger, if I could have had the best of everything in the world, oh, that would have been a real, I would have been a real mess by now. It's due to these these rather unfortunate uh, problems that we create that and we create misery, and from that misery drives us sometimes into looking at it and understanding it. And that's what I see here in the in a Buddhist monastery here, Amravati, is that I see all of you as beings who are here in order to realize truth. So it's a sangha, isn't it? This is what sangha is about. This is our refuge in sangha. Community of people, of beings whose aim is to realize the truth, to be free from delusion. And so this is another miracle that there can be a Sangha, a group, more than one human beings who who can who are determined to realize the truth, practice the Dhamma. So I offer this for your reflection. <laughs> 